Praise God. Praise God. Let's take that to heart. Not only let it be a good song, but let's take that to heart. Let's pray for one another. I pray for you, you pray for me. We need each other to survive. It's God's will that every need be supplied. And we do that by giving and helping and praying for one another. So let us do that. Not because we're here this Sunday morning doing it, but through the week. Remember your brothers and sisters. Remember who was looking a little peaky today. Not that anybody's looking peaky today, but if anybody is looking peaky today, remember them Wednesday morning or a Thursday morning. You may not know what the problem is, but just say a little prayer for your brothers and your sisters. We need each other to survive. So let's think about that. I want to go back to last week's message. And I'm going to read to you from the book of John, chapter 16, and verse 33. And it says, These things, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me, Jesus is speaking. We know that because it's written in red, right? I can see it. Anyway, Jesus said, in me, you might have peace. In me, you might have peace. In the world, you shall. The words, in me, you might have peace. If you choose to, you can. It is available for you. In me, you can have peace. But in the world, you don't have a choice. You shall have trouble. Trouble will come to you in the world. But in me, you might have peace. You can if you want to. But you shall have trouble in the world. But be of good cheer. For I... Jesus have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. And we ask ourselves, Jesus, how can I be happy when I'm in trouble? Because he has overcome the world. And if you believe and trust in him, you can have peace. When we put our trust in God, he will give us peace in the midst of hell. Jesus is telling us here that I'm telling you this so that you will know that you can have peace when you're in trouble or in the world. So when you're in trouble and you trust in God, Instead of panic, you begin to look for the peace. It is, that is the way it works with us. We begin to look for the peace instead of panic. And we know that that peace can be found in some of the worst times. I'm reminded of the three Hebrew boys cast into the fiery furnace. They were just sitting there walking around. That's no place for fellowship in the fiery furnace. But they're just in there walking around. And last week we talked about Paul and Silas beaten, thrown into prison, and chained to the wall. What were they thinking? They were thinking about God because they began to praise, they began to worship singing hymns, and pray. They started a revival in prison, chained to the wall. So what we have to look at is we know that it can take place because we've seen it. We believe in Christ, so we believe that he can give us that peace in the middle of whatever trouble we find ourselves in. 
But today I want to expose you to the pioneer of that piece, of that curriculum, of how these things got started. In the book of Genesis, chapter 37, beginning at verse 18, it says here, And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us kill him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of this dreamer. Now, who is this dreamer that they're talking about? This dreamer that they're talking about is Joseph. And who is it that's talking about him like this? That's his ten older brothers. They're talking about killing their little brother and throwing him into a pit. And then telling people that some beast ate him. Why do you suppose they come to that conclusion? They came to that conclusion because little brother was a snitch. He told on them. He told everything they did. And if you got any little brothers and little sisters, you know that's how it go. They'll rat you out in a minute. But this boy didn't learn because his dad gave him a brand new coat sold it himself, a coat of many colors, and he gave it to Joseph. Now the brothers hates him a little bit more because now dad loves him better than he loves all the rest. He never made any of us a, a colorful coat. So now there's two strikes against the boy. But then that ain't all. He has a dream. A dream about them out in a field gathering wheat and stacking it and his sheaf stood up straight and their sheaves bowed to his sheaf. Now you know they want to kill him. So that made him even madder. But he didn't stop there because he had another dream. And this time he dreamed that the sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowed down to him. Now his dad got in on that. That cool it, son. Wait a minute. Are you saying your mom and me and your 11 brothers is having to bow down to you? So you see, when they saw Joseph coming from afar off, they saw that colorful coat coming, and they decided, let's just get rid of him because here we are out here in the wilderness. Nobody can see us. Let's kill him and get rid of him. And when he got to them, they went about that business. They grabbed him and tore that coat off of him. And their older brother Reuben stopped him. So they threw him in the pit alive. And Reuben had a plan to find favor with the father. He would get him out when they wouldn't watch him and take him back. And then Joseph, being the snitch that he was, he'd tell his dad that his brothers tried to kill him. But Reuben saved my life. Now Reuben's on top again, yeah? But that didn't happen because Reuben took the first watch so that he would be available to take him out while the rest of them were asleep and on the watch and so forth. But they saw some Ishmaelites coming by, travelers, traders, going down to Egypt to sell stuff. So they said, well, why should we just let the boy die in the pit? Let's make a little money off of it, too. So they took him out of the pit and sold him. And then the Israelites took Joseph down to Egypt and sold him to Potiphar, the chief of the guard, or the captain of the guard of Pharaoh's army, bought Joseph from his brothers. And he was happy with him. Because as soon as Joseph showed up, everything in his life began to change. He began to prosper. In the Genesis 39, verse 1, it says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, 
And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of bought him of the hands of bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was prosperous, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in the sight of in his sight, in the sight of Potiphar. And he served him, and he made him overseer, Potiphar made Joseph overseer of his house and all that he had. And Potiphar put into Joseph's hands everything that he had. And it came to pass from time to time he had made him overseer of his house and over all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake and the blessings of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hands and he knew not what he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a godly person and well favored. Here's a boy who was a messenger for his father, spying on his brothers, knew a little bit about sheep maybe after watching him, but here he is now running a plantation or farm, whatever Potiphar had there, the farm. So he's buying and selling, planting and harvesting, hiring and firing. He's running the whole thing because God was with him. Why do you suppose that took place with this young boy, 17 years old, who had never done any of the things that he's now doing? Because God was with him. But God would not have been with Joseph had Joseph been kicking and screaming. Had Joseph been threatening and cursing. Had Joseph been holding a grudge saying how he was going to get even with his brothers. What does that tell us in our relationship with God that when we are of good cheer then we can have peace in any situation. I want you to stop and let that soak in for a minute. You have been ripped away from your family, sold into slavery and what are you going to do about it? How do you feel about it? Because I'm not going to work. I'm going to go down and lay down. They just have to beat me to death. They kill me. I'm, I'm not doing anything because I don't belong here. But not Joseph. He went there and he worked. And everything he put his hands to prospered. Because God was with him. We have to understand at some point in our lives that life is not about us. Sometimes when bad things happen or things are not going our way, it's not about us. But do you know that God cannot use you for the mission that he has chosen you for unless you are willing and obedient? And you can't be willing and obedient if you are mad and got your own program to get even with the reason that you're there. In this world, you shall have trouble. But in me, you might have peace. But you have to be of good cheer because I've already made the way for you. And if you know God, then you know that all things works together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And nothing just happens. I'm paving the way for a prosperous, happy life. All we have to do is might have. We have to accept it. We have to choose 
You see, because Joseph wasn't through there. He didn't just go down to Potiphar's house and make Potiphar rich and be uh, celebrated in Potiphar's sight because Potiphar's wife had other plans for him. Potiphar saw this young strapping fellow running around there and, and, uh, and Mr. Potiphar is always gone. She said to herself, well, you know, why not, Joseph? Come on in here and take me up on this sexual activity. Let's me and you get it on because Potiphar's gone. And Joseph said, no, can't do it. But Miss Potiphar knew she was fine and he can't turn me down. So she caught him another time and switched it up to him. But listen to what Joseph had to say about the thing. Joseph said, Joseph said, there is nobody in this house with as much authority as I have. I am in control of everything and I know where everything is. And nobody does anything without me. But there's only one thing that I do not have control over. And that is you because you are my master's wife. And I, listen to me carefully, I will not commit this evil and sin against my God. Against my God. He wouldn't care about Potiphar. He didn't care about her. You see where Joseph's mind was. He wouldn't do the evil against God. At the forefront of his mind was doing what was right in the eyes of God. Think about it. A young strapping male man. Not a post-up man. I'm a male man. You're a male man. With a woman who is willing. And she has made the first move. He don't have to do no work. All he got to do is go take care of the business. But he refuses to because it is against his God. Not, well, I can get just a little, I can do just a little bit and God won't mind. Yeah, just a, no, not, I can't do it because I will not commit this wickedness and sin against my God. So you know what Miss Potiphar did? Miss Potiphar caught him the very next day and grabbed him. And Joseph ran. And Mrs. Potiphar ripped his coat off. As he ran out of his coat. Boys having trouble keeping coats, if you notice. Ran out of his coat. And now Miss Potiphar screams, Ray! Ray! Because she's got his coat. Her husband comes home, Mr. Potiphar, the captain of the guard, which is probably number three in the government. So he's a big guy. He can do anything you want to do. And he shows up at home and Mrs. Potiphar said, see, this boy you brought in here, came in here, tried to rape me. If you'd have left him out there, but wherever he was, he'd have... and Mr. Potiphar, of course, he got mad. And he put Joseph in prison. Sent Joseph to prison. Now think about this. He's already a slave. Now he's a prisoner slave. But the good point, Mr. Potiphar could have cut his head off because that's what they did to rapists in those days. You see, they didn't have a prison system that uh, cared about that sort of thing. So he would have died naturally or normally. But God, God was with him, it says. Because Mr. Potiphar put him in the prison and when Mr. Potiphar put him in the prison, the warden of the prison saw him and liked him. And as he conducted his work around the prison and so forth, the warden saw that God was with him. So the warden said, you handle it. And the warden put all the prisoners and all of the administration under Joseph's care. Now here's a boy again. He was 17 when he started out 
hadn't done anything in life. He has ran a plantation. Now he's running a prison. Sitting the guard schedule. Who's going to guard today? What time? What hours? What the prisoners are going to eat? What the prisoners are going to do? It says that everything that the prisoners did, the warden didn't even check on it because it was in Joseph's care. He just let it ride. It says here. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison, the, the warden. And the warden of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners and were in all the prisoners that were in the prison and whatsoever they did there he was the doer of it Joseph was the keeper of the prison the warden looked not to anything that was under Joseph's hands because the Lord was with him and that which he did the Lord made to prosper The Lord made what Joseph did to prosper. Why? What was Joseph doing all of this time that the Lord would make it prosper in prison? Joseph was honoring the Lord. And Joseph was not complaining. He's, he's beating this into our, our being that when we are at peace with Christ... He will make all things possible for us. All things are possible through Christ. But without Christ, you can't do anything. But in this world, you're going to have trouble. But if you're not cheerful, then you're going to have problems. Complaining and whimpering holding a grudge and getting even does not get the job done. How many missions have we had to have reassigned because as God had given them to us, somebody bumped into us and knocked a donut out of our hand and, and we blew up. How dare you do that to me? I'll kill you for that. Uh, who do I God said, well, I got to get another guy to go do this now because this one didn't work out. Complaining, whimpering, crying, getting angry, holding a grudge, fostering hatred, envy, jealousy, all of these things that alter our life in Christ. We have to again go back to what the book said. You can cast all of your cares on me and I'll care for you. So when something happens in your life, you don't have to care about it. And it doesn't mean that you don't have to attend to it or pay attention to it. But it means that it is not your problem. You can give it to God and move on. Well, I know this is unfair. I know this is not right. You handle it, God. And then go off and whistle while you work. Say, you know what just happened to him? And listen to him. He's over there whistling. What's wrong with this guy? This guy's got God. This guy doesn't have a care in the world because he doesn't have to. If he belongs to God, then it becomes God's problem. This is where Joseph is. Uh, Joseph's in prison, running everything. Running everything. And what happens? Two guys show up from the palace, from Pharaoh's palace. The butler and the baker. They show up. Now they, under Joseph's care in the prison, and Joseph 
catches them one morning whining and looking sad and asks them, what, what's your problem, guys? And they said, we had a dream and can't nobody interpret it. So we're sad. So Joseph said, tell it to me. Now normally, you would say, you had a dream. Well, you keep that to yourself. I don't know, want to know nothing about it because that's what got me in this fix in the first place. But Joseph said, no, tell me your dream. Tell it to me. They told it. The baker, the butler told it first. The butler said that he was in the, in the vineyard and there were three beautiful clusters of grapes on the vine. And he had Pharaoh's cup in his hand. He took those beautiful clusters of grapes and he squares them into Pharaoh's cup and handed them to Pharaoh. And Joseph said, the three clusters of grapes are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. The butler, the baker, got really happy about that because, hey, that's good news. Let me hear up and tell you mine. He said, I was on my way to give Pharaoh some pastry. I had three baskets on my head. In that top basket was all kinds of beautiful pastry and delicacies and delicious baked goods. And the birds came and they ate all of the bread out of that top basket. Joseph said, the three baskets is three days. In three days, Pharaoh is going to lift your head up. And he's going to cut it off. And he's going to nail your hide to a tree. And the birds is going to eat your flesh. In three days, it was Pharaoh's birthday. They found out which one of those guys was the bad guys. He restored the butler and killed the baker, just like he said. But on the way out of the prison, Joseph said to the butler, he said, when you get back and get in the presence of Pharaoh, remember me. Just mention my name, man. Mention my name when you get back to Pharaoh. The guy went on. Joseph's 28 years old now. 28 years old. He's been in this fix now for what? 11 years. He showed up when he was 17. He's 28 now. And the butler goes on back to work for Pharaoh. And two years pass. No hope for Joseph. He's, he's done. But two years pass and Pharaoh has a dream. And Pharaoh is ugly. He's mad and uneasy and nobody can get along with him. But who's in his face all the time? This cupbearer because he's got to give him his cup. So he's getting the brunt of all of this stuff. And finally it hits him. Oh, you know, when I was in prison where you sent me, there was a guy who witnessed or who interpreted my dreams and the baker's dream and everything he said came true so they sent for Joseph and brought Joseph out and put him in front of Pharaoh and Pharaoh told Joseph his dream about the seven fat cows that came up out of the river and then seven skinny cows came up looked like they were half dead and weather beaten they ate the seven fat cows. But after they ate them, they still looked just as bad as they did when they started. And that frightened him. So he woke up out of his sleep. And he went back to sleep. A stalk of corn grew up with seven plump, juicy ears of corn on it. And then a stalk with seven weather-beaten, dried-up, withered ears of corn on that one. And it ate the the plump coin and they didn't get no better and Pharaoh is now in a huff and so Joseph tells him he says the seven fat cows and the seven plump ears of corn those are seven good years that Egypt is going to have seven great years but the seven skinny cows and the seven blight ears of corn those are seven bad years there'll be a famine after the good years but what you need to do, Pharaoh, is find a wise man who can gather enough food during those seven good years to last through those seven bad years. 
and Pharaoh thought it was a great idea, talked to his cabinet about it. They couldn't come up with anybody. And then he goes back and tells Joseph, he says, you know, you seem to have God with you. You got God with you. So you had the idea, so you do it. You'll be my guy. So Pharaoh took off his signal ring and put it on Joseph's finger. And he said to Joseph, he said, except for on the throne, nobody in Egypt can raise a hand or a foot without your permission. Only I will have authority over you when I'm on the throne. But all the rest of that time, you the man. Get him a linen robe and put on him. Get him my second chariot. Put him in my second house and give him the priest's wife, Annette, to marry. And then get at it, boy. Now, Joseph is in charge of everything in Egypt. Everything. And the good years come and then the bad years come. And I want to go find <laughs> where Joseph where Joseph is in charge. He's buying and selling everything and, and uh, selling the grain and so forth. And the story goes he sells everything and everybody and every so forth. But his brothers show up. That That's the part I want to get to. And I don't want to spend time looking for it because it's in well, it's in there. <laughs> it's, in, it's in Genesis 45, 43. Is it 2? 40. It's in Genesis 43. Anyway, his brothers show up to buy grain. And when they show up to buy grain, they show up and they meet Joseph to buy the grain. And they tend of them. Bow their face to the ground. And Joseph asked them, who are you and where are you from? They say, we're from Canaan. We just come to buy food. And it says that Joseph spoke roughly to them because he recognized them, but he was a stranger to them. So he toyed with them. But the question that you have to ask yourself, do you think Joseph remembered when he told them the dream? When he told them the dream, do you think he was remembering that when they were standing there like that, bowed, bowed down to it? And then he had to get to the point where they threw him in the pit and then taking him out of the pit and selling him to, to uh, the Israelites. He had to think of all that while they're standing there with him. And he has the authority to just say, I want these men put in prison and executed next week. That's what he had the power to do. And they're standing there, bowing before Joseph. Something that caused them so much hatred and so much anger that they were willing to kill their own brother. And they sold him into slavery. And now they're doing it. I'm pointing out the fact that when God has a plan or a message then all we have to do is go with it. You see, Joseph told Pharaoh when he was telling that dream about the cows and then the corn, the same dream, different players, same circumstances. Joseph had had that same thing. And this is why I'm wondering if he thought about that because when he was 17, he probably didn't know what he knows now at 30. He's 30 years old now. And he understood Pharaoh's situation. He said, that's the same dream. Same dream. Different characters, different players. You got corn on one hand and cows on the other, but the circumstances are the same. Well, his was the same. He had uh, sheaves on one and the stars on the other, but the circumstances were the same. People had to bow to him. And now here he is. And the Bible says, let everything be established by two or more witnesses. So you see, Joseph and Pharaoh had the same circumstances. Their dreams were established. And Pharaoh's came true and Joseph's came true. And now here these boys are bent over in front of their brother, worshiping him. Or being, paying obedience to him, we should say. 
And he toys with them and sells them the grain and sends them away. But tells them don't come back no more unless they bring their brother with them. And he keeps one of them just for safekeeping. Playing with them. They go away and they do. They come back and they bring their brother with them. He gets to see his little brother, Benjamin. He toys with him a while again, but he can't take it. He is so um, filled with, with, with relief and, and, I guess, joy of seeing his whole family intact. They're telling him that their dad is okay, and he asked me, you know, that old man you told me about the last time you was here, is he still alive? And so, and they say, yeah, our father is still alive. And they're bowing when they're talking to him. Yes, sir, and then, thank you for asking. And they do that about three or four times. And then Joseph can't take it no more, so he sends his servants away. Joseph's got servants. Joseph's got servants. He, you know, he, he's a big man. He's in charge of all Egypt. So he, he sends his servants out of the room so he can reveal himself to his brothers. But it says that he breaks down. He ter- cries and weeps. And then he tells them, hey, look, I'm Joseph. I'm Joseph. I'm your brother. And they don't believe it. They are so blown away that they're like stuck like a deer in the headlight. And he tells them, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. And don't be afraid. Don't be sorry or afraid. He said, God sent me ahead so that I could preserve life for you. If you hadn't thrown me in the pit and sold me to the Ishmaelites, the whole country might be dead by now. Who else could have done what I just did? But because of where I was at 17, you are alive and eating well today when I'm 30, 13 years later. God doesn't answer our prayers. God doesn't finish our mission until his time. You see, we get a, an idea or say a prayer, and if it don't happen today or maybe next week, oh, well, then God ain't going to answer that. Thirteen years later, they're bowing. Something they, they probably swore in their hearts that they'd never do. Not to him. That's our little brother, the little snitch who tells on us and who, who, who don't get along with us at all. Never going to bow to him. But they are. Because God had a plan. I'm saying again, I said this before, I will say it again. When things happen and you get involved, it is not always about you. Joseph said he was sent there to save lives. He had to go through all of that so everybody else could live. He wasn't angry. He wasn't mad. He didn't want to get even with them. He said, don't be afraid and don't be sorry because this was God's plan so that I could save lives. Stop whining and complaining when things happen to you. You may have a bigger thing. God works on a big picture. And we narrow it down to this much and think we really got a grip on things. But the, the, the most important part, I think, of the whole story is the very end. In uh, Genesis 51, and I know that one. In Genesis 51 where Joseph's father dies and it says that them boys are really shaken now when Joseph's father died not 51 50 I'm sorry it's only 50 verses in there 50 yeah it says when Joseph's father died his brother sent messengers to him watch this watch this and and Genesis 50, 15. And when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will surely hate us and will certainly require us all, repay us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph saying, your father did command 
before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did, did unto you evil. And now we pray you, forgive the trespasses of your servants, of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. Joseph cried when they told him that. And his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be your servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. For am I in the place of God? A am I God? Don't fear me. Am I God? But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good. To bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. The same thing. To save much people alive. So don't be afraid. Therefore, I'm going to go with the name. Therefore, fear ye not, I will nourish you. I'm going to still feed you. I'm going to take care of you. I will feed you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly unto them. Have you got that kind of character where you can offer to support someone who has done bad to you? You have to have that unconditional love to go that far, you see. And this is what Joseph has got. He's got that unconditional love to where he can still tell his brothers, don't be afraid. I'm going to feed you and I will take care of your little ones and whatever you need. Whatever you need. See, he had forgave them way back then. If he don't forgive them way back then, he never gets to where he's going in the first place. But where, where are we in a walk with Christ that when a person does something to us, we can walk away and look like we're really big people by saying, I'll never speak to him again. I'll never speak to him again. I'll never forgive him for what he done to me. What did he do to you? Well, he was supposed to take me to the prom and turn me down. You see, you see how small, how small of a situation it takes to separate us from our destiny with Christ. Oh, he stole my pencil when I was in grade school. So I don't trust him and I'll never forgive him for that because I flunked that test that day. But you're still alive and you're successful now. He didn't hurt you. God had a plan. God had a plan. You have to, again, learn how to forgive. In Matthew chapter 6, around uh, 9, it tells us the uh, model prayer. And at the end of the model prayer, he goes back and reiterates the part where he says, forgive us our debtors as we forgive those who trespass against us. He goes back and reiterate that in verse 14 of, of chapter 6 in Matthew. And he says that if you don't forgive those who trespass against you, then your heavenly Father cannot forgive you. You see, and we just say the prayer and we don't even understand what we're saying because that's exactly what we say. Forgive us ours as we forgive them. But then we don't forgive them, so he can't forgive us because we didn't forgive them as he forgave us. So you see, we tell him not to forgive us because we are not forgiving somebody else. But we just don't put it together. Because we say when we man, I never forgive him. I ain't never forgive him. No, I never forget him. Forgive him. But then we go and say our prayers at night, forgive him as I forgive but wait a minute, you didn't forgive him. You just said you were never going to. And if it's in your heart not to, then you just told God, don't forgive me because I'm not forgiving him. Death and life is in the power of the tongue again. 
we have to be aware of what we're saying. We get to quoting these verses and saying all this stuff. And sometimes we are cutting our own throat. We have to operate in the love of Christ so that we are always in the right place with Christ. Because he can't be in where we are when we are being hateful and unforgiving, carrying a grudge, jealous of somebody, mad at somebody. I'm going to go back to the original verse that we started out with in John chapter 16 and verse 33. And I want to reiterate that before we go. He says, these things I have spoken unto you. All of the things that Jesus has said to us, he has told us that. That in me, so that when we trust in him and believe him, in me, why would we trust in him? Because he's the one that said that, lo, I will be with you always. He's the one that says that all of your needs should be met through his riches and glory. He's the one that says that if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. He's the one that says that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He's saying all of these things, but if you believe in him, then you might have peace. See, all of that is what gives us peace. And instead of quoting these scriptures, we put them into action when the things come up before us. When somebody do something to you, okay, well, I forgive you. I forgive you. Whether he forgive, whether he wants it or not. Because you won't always be in good stead. So when you forgive a guy, it's not for him, it's for you. It's not for him. Oh, if I forgive him, then he's going to be... No, it doesn't matter what he does. You forgave him, now you're good. That's what he said. So he's told us all of these things that we might have peace. We might have peace. But in the world, you are going. He said, you shall have trouble. You shall. It's coming. And why is that? Because the devil is the prince of this world. The enemy is the ruler of this world. The enemy comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. So all he wants to do is hurt you. So you're going to have trouble. Somehow, somewhere, sometime. Well, if I get saved, God will protect me. Yes, he will. But it ain't going to stop the devil from attacking you. And if there is any cracks in your armor... You toast. Oh, I got saved, so I'm good. No, you're not. When you got saved, you became the target. You used to be the devil's, now you're not. Now he's mad and he's going to get you for good. Sure, now. Unless you have taken charge of what God has provided for you. These things, he said, and in him, you can have that peace. You can have peace in hell because he's with you. But in the world, you're going to have trouble. But you have to be of good cheer. You have to be of good cheer. And please understand the definition. The cheering is not that you're running around, hey, yeah, good, I'm in. You, that ain't what he's talking about. He just said, be of good cheer, be assured, be satisfied in your heart and in your mind that you're good. Oh, I just got run over by a car. Yeah! I just got sh- shot in the butt with an arrow. Woo! No, don't be a cheer when stuff happens to you. You be a good cheer because you know that you're safe. You know that you're saved. Don't 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 get ridiculous with it. Just understand what you're doing. Nobody may not even know you're happy, but you smile under your breath and say, "Boy, the devil's gonna get his rear end brought to him now. He doesn't mess with the wrong person. God's gonna get him." 
and move on. But you can be of good cheer. And that's where you have to be for God to do what God is going to do. Because if you are in other, other, any other state of mind, God's going to just step back and let you handle it. He's going to step back and let you handle it. And you can't whip the devil. You can't whip the devil. The weapons of warfare that you are accustomed to don't work. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You've got to have the armor of God. Faith. Truth. Righteousness. Salvation. Love. Those are the things that wins the battles. So think about it. And adapt a life of Christ so that you can win every battle, every time. Even though you're going to be under attack all the time. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. But in me, you might have peace.